welcome back to the Map Round Show. Gigi, welcome. Thank you. Um, today we're going to talk about this whole thing called Castonomics. Um, this book, specifically the Castonomic uh, Revolution, a la on screen. Um, the rise of African informal economies. Um, and before we get into the meat and potatoes, we seemingly have a lot of mutual friends. There's uh, Joe Evans, we just spoke about. We had the same publisher, Tracy McDonald, Gil Oved from the Creative Council. So I'm viewing this as a, you know, when nothing, ha- did I say everything happens for a reason? Like, I yeah. reckon that this is a very timeless time to be having this conversation for the simple reason that, what's that quote you told me right in the beginning? The blind. Well, in the land of the mind, uh, yeah. blind, the one-eyed man is king, yeah. That's and uh, this is a, an environment no one knows, any, well, very few people outside of the informal economy know anything about. So, where do we start with this? Um, I think, let's paint a picture of the background, because I think you've got such an incredibly unique uh, upbringing. Um, walk us through that. Well, yeah, so... Um, I, I grew up, my, my parents were political activists and they believed the only way to change people's lives was to live just like them. So they built a mud hut with no running water in a place which was at the time the poorest place in KZN and the um, and and still is in fact the poorest place in KZN. So they built a mud hut with no running water, no electricity. Um, my mother taught us at home, we were incredibly poor. Uh, and in fact, my mother still lives just like that. She walks down to the river to wash, and she's part of, of incredible, the, yeah. the, the village. Um, and we grew up herding goats and stick fighting. Those were my core kind of skills. And I kind of only realized later in life the huge benefits that come from that. Um, well, it's going to come in handy later when you start swinging baseball bats. <laughs> so, yeah, in fact, the first time I realized the huge benefit of growing up like that, we felt we were incredibly underprivileged. Um, if we uh, had meat, we used to, um, if we visited friends in town and had meat for supper, we'd say, like, what died? Because the only time we had meat was when something <laughs> died. And... Um, I, I, in fact, I'm a migrant worker. When I moved to Joburg, the first time I realized the huge benefits is I was uh, in a pick and pay in, in Northgate and I was writing out a check, which shows how old I am. And um, I was writing out a check and the lady behind the counter said to the lady who was packing the bags, she said, which means look at this white man, he's got hair like a baboon. Which, which is obviously referring to my arms, not my uh, head. You had hair. <laughs> I had hair, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> So I said nothing. I wrote out the check and I tore it out and I gave it to her and I said, "What were you born in check? Have you ever seen a baboon <laughs> writing out a check?" And so, with which she screamed and she said, "Sorry, boss." <laughs> so I said, "Oh, sing sugu in fene, sing u bas manje." And I've gone from baboon to bass. With which she fled and she stood behind this pillar and she kept saying, sorry, boss, sorry, boss. And I thought it was really funny and I was telling her to come back and she wouldn't come back. And the manager came and, of course, all the different tills were all laughing because everyone told each other this. And the madams were sitting at the behind the queue and saying, what's going on in the front? And and the whole place came to a standstill. And, and um, I realized a huge benefit about it and it's part of in, in my books and stuff like that is about the, the important thing about understanding our society is beyond just language because a lot of people speak different languages but it's actually understanding deeper things about lifestyle about understanding mm. humor and irony and sarcasm and and what are people's hopes and fears and dreams because you know we know more about the animals in Africa their lifestyle their behavior and what they do than we know about the people in Africa particularly the people who live outside of our urban upper income environments um, and I realized the huge benefits of that was growing up in those environments um, was, um, in fact, when I was a kid, I said to my father, will you send me to to um, uh, university? And he said, I'll never afford to send to university, but I'll bring you up prepared for a life in Africa. And uh, in many ways, I think that that, that was a, a, a big thing. And, and uh, I've, I've spent my life um, in these Townships, Gassi, um, you call it Cassie, it's it's Gassi. Um, <laughs> so the look Gassi is where the term comes from. <laughs> Cassie, less, I less said Cassie. <laughs> this is Cassie nomics. So thing. the Fuck. Gassi. Um, so yeah, so Gassi. I'm then, building so, your yeah. rep in for American, mate, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, 
Yeah, so, you know, there's this, uh, and I say to people, there's these invisible economies, these massive invisible economies which we don't know. They're invisible, though, to a certain part of our society. They're not invisible to the black people and the township, Gassi people who live in those environments. Um, and so, yeah, so, so that's how I grew up, and, and, um, and, and it's been a huge benefit. And, and uh, when I moved to the city, I, I am, and now I'm a migrant worker, as I said, um, I have lots of fun speaking Zulu and looking like I do, you know. I think people expect I'm a rugby player and then, <laughs> then I start speaking Zulu or Tosa or Sutu. Um, in fact, it's quite funny. I had a, I have a daughter called, my daughters are called Zandi and Gonsi. Gonsi means snowdrop and Zandi is a, is a, um, is a, w a name for, you've had enough children, so I'd had enough, you know, I was <laughs> like Zandi. <coughs> But Zandi hasn't got an English name, and she's been brought up speaking Zulu, and she hangs out with my. Uh, she she goes to Msinga and lives with my, with her Gogo, and she really enjoys it, and uh, she kind of considers herself Zulu, although she's very blonde and blue-eyed. Um, and a while ago, we went to a restaurant, and Zandi. Um, was playing with the other kids and this um, waitress said to her, what's your name? She said, Zandi. And the waitress said, what's your English name? She said, no, I don't have an English name. She said, well, why is your name Zandi? So Zandi said, because my father is Zulu. Because for Zandi, it's a cultural thing. It's not a racial thing. And so this uh, lady said, um, where's your father? So Zandi pointed across the room at me. And this uh, waitress looked at me and said, no, he's not Zulu. <laughs> And uh, Zandi said, was very upset. She was like, he's Zulu. Of course he's Zulu. Was I come? I'll show you. So this waitress walked over and she chatted to me in Zulu and we had a chat. And she said, ah, hey, you could Zulu. Hey, you could speak very good Zulu. But she said, you're not a Zulu. So I said, no, I am Zulu. I said, umam, 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 velasi, was a Makunwini. We grew up in the Mkunu tribe. And I uh, told her the praise names, the king of the Mkunu, the Smagati, who brought us up. And she was like big eyes. She was like, yo, 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 it's true. Of course, my mother's not Mam Velasi, but it's a nice name, a word, you know, story to tell. So um, anyway, this waitress now starts staring down at me, and uh, I say, what's wrong? She said, eh, oh, fine in a colored. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't look like a colored. So I said, no, 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 you know, us coloreds aren't the same. I said, some of us are quite white like me. But you said, you must see my brother, he's pitch black. She went, oh, shame, <laughs> your poor brother. <laughs> anyway. What a great yeah. story, man. <laughs> so your name also, um, I suppose, goes also ties back to your beginning in that cultural, at least what you're explaining to me, was that, you know, it's named after an event or a characteristic, right? Yeah. So um, explain that to me. And to our audience. So, so, well, I was christened Mark John in a very Calvinistic way. Um, and um, But my parents, as I said, were political activists and they were fighting the government. And at the time, in the area, the government was bulldozing people's homes and moving them into what they called the homelands or the Bantu stands. Um, and uh, my parents were fighting that. And so my mother, who was a journalist, was either sitting... Um, in fact, uh, the day I was born, she... Uh, gave birth to me very quickly and then turned to a typewriter and was writing press releases. Um, and uh, as a young baby, I was on her hip when they were trying to stand. Of course, you know, a very blonde, beautiful white woman with a child on her hip was really successful at stopping bulldozers, bulldozing black people's homes. So I was named after the time of Gigi. Gigi was the government garage, the number plates of the um, of the government vehicles and uh, I was named as, as I was saying earlier Johnny Clegg had a song called Wenza no Gigi Aga Nagi no Gnaga, which means what's Gigi doing he doesn't care so um, I was named after the same Skatska Gigi the time of Gigi and uh, as a kid my praise names were all about how brave my parents were fighting the government and mm. could stand in front of the bulldozers and um, and of course, uh, no one ever called me anything different. The only time I was called Mark was by the principal at school when I was in trouble or um, the bank manager when I was in even more trouble. <laughs> so, so I've been called Gigi for, for my whole life. So. Okay, awesome. Um, so that, that, uh, that statement that you, that you say and you describe in your book about what your dad said about preparing you for a life in Africa, I love that. I think that's such yeah. a powerful sentence because... It is completely unique, you know, and everything yeah. we're going to talk about is completely unique. And I love it because, you know, 
there's so I just uh, just from running businesses, you invariably have to engage with international service providers, yeah. software houses, and stuff like that. Whatever you know, you need trying to build a business and scale, so you need systems. And then you'll find that they try and take their U.S. model yeah. and shove it into an African context 100%, and think yeah. it's going to scale and work there. It just doesn't. Yeah. You know. Look, and I, and I think that, I mean, in fact, part of what I wrote about in Gasinomic Revolution, my, my latest book, was exactly that. And I, in fact, I talked about count, uh, Gasinomic Revolutionaries, who were people who adapted to the African marketplaces and made huge billions of, of dollars. And the Gasinomic Counter Revolutionaries, companies like um, Chappies, uh, I wrote about Chappies. In fact, um, I used to do all, I used to write all the did you knows inside Chappie's bubblegum wrappers. So one of the few things my kids think is really cool about their dad. So you're famous, you know? basically. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and. Round uh, of applause, yeah. clap that up. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know, uh, uh, that's uh, a complete uh, new one for me. Uh, and, they, and they all have to be 100% true. So, I mean, the one year we had a wonderful time because we had to write um, a did you know for every soccer team that participated in the Soccer World Cup. And the Scottish soccer team um, qualified, and we had great ones for Brazil and Argentina and Germany and everything. And uh, I mean, I think the Argentinian one was, did you know that the Argentinian soccer team crashed in the Andes and had to eat each other alive and stuff like this? <laughs> um, but the, the Scottish one couldn't come up with anything cool. So um, we eventually ended up with one which said, on average, Scottish soccer players have one leg shorter than another. Of course, all human beings have one leg shorter than another on average. And um, so, but it, it was a great one for the Scottish. And, and about uh, after that ca they came out, a, short, a few weeks later, we were contacted, or Cadbury's was contacted by the um, Scottish League of South Africa. And they said we were discriminating against Scottish soccer players and could we, uh, Scottish people, and could we remove it? And so we had to remove it off the. <laughs> Chappies, um, did you know? We just showed how important people um, considered uh, the did you knows. But I can tell you what, when you have any of those games with uh, general knowledge questions, I use my did you know. <laughs> it was before Google we had uh, Chappies, did you know? <laughs> but Chappies destroyed value. They had a business where they sold 350 odd million tons of Chappies a year. And it was taken over by the international branch, eventually Mondelez, which is an international yeah. company. And today they do slightly over 100,000 um, tons of, of, um, of chappies a, a year, which is, is crazy. Mm. They've like destroyed that brand. Um, and Champion Toffees was another one. We had, um, in fact, my story in the book starts with, um, we had a monkey called Monkey. Um, and and monkey was the tamest monkey you could have, and and a monkey used to run across the river and and go to Mbele's trading store, which was this old red brick trading store, and jump across along the fence and pass the dogs and get into um, Bailey's store and steal all the uh, champion toffees, and would come back hopping across the Tugela River with these big cheeks full of um, champion toffees and her tongue was black and, and this was our favorite sweet was champion toffees and champion toffees did the same it was bought out by a company that decided to to um, move into the formal retail they decided to forget the hawkers and the spaza shops and stuff and and went to the formal retail and destroyed the brand and uh, and there's so many tragic stories um as as in fact there's other stories of the revolutionaries who just changed the africa with these amazing brands but um it's it's a it's a space that for many people because unquantified People don't understand how big it is. And this is one of the dangers to entrepreneurs. And, and it's not only about Africa, it's across the world, you know. I mean, I tell my kids the, the jobs, you know, that they, they need to start looking at informal economies anywhere in the world. Airbnb and, and, and Uber are good examples of informal businesses. But if you look at Africa, some of those, the rules that are applied are often the rules that are applied for a formal sector. Um, and we're not understanding the informal sector, the scale of it. And and the problem with it is there's no research. So every time I meet with the corporate business, they say, well, what what's the business model? Have? What yeah. is the – no one's got quantifiable information. Yeah. 
well, I, I've got quite a lot of quantifiable information, but um, there's very little um, quantifiable information. And you, st it, you have to change the rules. The rules become about qualitative information. You need to understand lifestyles. You need to understand behavior. You need to understand trends. You need to understand these things to understand what are the opportunities. Um, you know, one of the examples I use is we built a one and a half billion rand industry for Parmalet cheese slices in um, in what's called a quarter in the township fast food, what I call Gassi course industry, purely because we understood it was a very big thing and there was this was the lifestyle, but we had no numbers. And this is the mistake companies make. Yeah. Um, so we're going to land some fundamentals in a second, but before we do that, because I think everything you're saying talks to this quote of the day. Yeah, so why don't you just walk us through this? I, I would, but I, I can't. So. <laughs> so the first one is in Lele Yaziwa Bay Hambile, which means the path is known by those who have walked it. And to an extent, you know, we I spend a lot of time in that environment. If you're wanting to get involved in this sector, um, you need to go out there and spend your time in the streets, in the homes, and, and, and embed yourself in those societies. The other one is Ingwe Ildangamabala, which means a leopard eats using his spots. Um, and in essence, a, a leopard understands the environment. It uses its spots to camouflage itself so it can eat. And, um, and this is probably one of the most fundamental things, is that we need to understand the environment around us and how do we become part of those environments to be successful in business. Um, and both of these two are the ones that, that I've applied in my business career. Well, I love it because it sets up everything we're going to talk about today. So let's get into some fundamentals because we we kind of we're skirting around it, but people are going, "What the fuck are these guys talking about? This massive biz this massive economy? It's informal. What the hell are we talking about?" So it's implied in the name, but just spell it out for us. So okay, so so Gasinomics is massive informal sector. Probably seventy five, eighty percent of our economy is actually informal sector. And I'll give you some examples. If you take the Gau train to Park Station, you leave the spaceship of the Gau train and you walk into Lagos, you know, and like within two hundred meters you're in downtown Joburg and Van Villach Street, and there's a lady there and her husband who sell um, fed cooks, Amaguinia, and they sell 2,500 to 3,000 fed cooks every single morning for one rand each. So they make 3,000 rand every single day. They also sell um, uh, uh, parmalet cheese slices, which is the other That's story. That's the quarter. The quarter one yeah. um, in the fed cook. And, and if you haven't had a warm um, fed cook with a cheese slice melting into it, you don't know anything. You yet. haven't lived. In fact, um, hey, are you guys, are you we guys were talking, feeling me here? Yeah. In fact, yeah. Q, don't you go yeah. past? Can you get some tomorrow morning for us? Let's yeah, just yeah, all, yeah. let's just live the dream. You have to have give, this. In fact, can you just give Q a mic yeah. the whole time because she's she's so, Zulu. So so no so. croissants or anything like that. Ikuinya uh, and a parmalet cheese. Nzobaneta la I food. Yeah. Mav's so, shaking his ears like, what yeah. the <laughs> In fact, we're ch chatting about my um, ex-business partner, Gil Ovid. Gil went with me into Soweto and, and early in the morning it was freezing cold and we had these clients with us and we went into this house and they had some warm um, fed cooks with cheese slices and Gil kind of casually grabbed one and threw a cheese slice in following what we were doing and he ate this thing and he leant back and he says... Could you hear the angels singing? I can hear the <laughs> trumpets and the angels. You have no idea. But anyway, this lady sells these, uh, her and her husband sell 3,000 3, odd um, uh, fed cook and about 500 rands worth of poloni, fish, um, cheese slices, tea and coffee every single day. So they make between two and a half, between 3,000 and 3,500 rand a day, of which they put in what they call, put in their pockets, about 1,500 to 2,000 rand a day. So they're making themselves, call it conservatively, 25,000 rand a month mm -hmm. cash. He buys 40 bags of um, supreme flour every single week. And... Um, they wake up at two in the morning. They um, uh, before they go to bed, they mix up the dough. The dough rises in the night, and then in the morning they take six buckets of dough. They get on a taxi and they ride to downtown Joburg. And when they get there, they pay thirty rand a week for a um, a storage 
in, in a little place there where the guys store their gas cylinder, their table, and all of these kind of things. And um, they arrive there at 3 in the morning, and when they get there, the, the, um, or the table and stuff is all ready. And I said to them, how often do you get there at 3 in the morning? I mean, it's dark, it's yeah. cold, 3 in the morning. How often do you get there? And the um, youngster, the mfana, who brings the, the um, gas cylinder and table and chairs is not there because they only pay 30 rand a week for this. So they looked at me confused. They were like, what do you mean? I said, how often is he late? They said, never. Why would he be late? Now, this, we, we call this informal economy, but the rules of this economy are, mm. are strict and, 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 and professional. So they, put, uh, they earn about 25,000 rand a month, and uh, they're building a house in Meadowlands in Soweto, a three-story house. And they've got, um, I went to visit the house, marble um, tabletops. They've got cherry wood um, you know, cupboards. Um, it's just a huge house. They're nearly finished. Because when I said to them, I said to um, the guy, I said, um, I said, uh, you know, why do you take a taxi? Well, you make 25,000 rand a month. You can buy a Skoro Skoro Bucky or something like that. And he said to me, no, 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 I don't want to buy the Bucky. Um, my wife said she wanted a house first. So when we finish the house, then I buy a Bucky. So I said, well, what will you buy? A second hand something? He says, no, I want a new Ranger or Hilux. But he says, you know, us black people, we prefer Toyota. So I think the Hilux, but maybe it will be the Ranger. Now, and she's got a son who they've got sons um, and uh, finished school. And I said, what does your son do? Why doesn't he come and work here? Because they want to start another stand just down the road. Now they'll be making 50 grand a month. And um, she said, no, this is not a job. I said, what do you mean it's not a job? You're at 3 in the morning, at 10 o'clock, you finished, you know, you make good money. She said, my son says he doesn't want to work here because it's not a job. So he's got a job at Edgar's as an assistant and a learner. I said, how much does he make a month? She said, he makes 2,000 rand that he puts in his pocket. So he would rather go to Edgar's and be a trainee and work there than actually work in this micro business and this entrepreneurial business. And this is the tragedy. We've created a society where we walk past the hawker who's making 25, 30,000 rand a month. We don't recognize that as a business because in our mindset, we have this power of a pay slip. When you have a pay slip or a formal business, mm. that is actually what a job is. Well, it's the status also, right? It's the status. It's it's how we've educated, but how we've created this this. So, so what has happened is we see the informal sector as survivalist or subsistence. Mm. And, um, you know, there's another story I write about here of a lady in, um, uh, in Tembisa who um, is selling a range of different foods on a table at the school. Now, there's 10 ladies at the school. And um, she, so anyway, I was chatting to her and I said, how long have you sold at the school? She said, I've sold here for 26 years. I was like, 26 years you've been selling at the school. She sells for three, uh, three times a day, first break, second break, and after school. And she makes 6,000 rand a month, every single month that she puts in her pocket. That's her profit. So it's quite funny because I said to her, well, how do you know how much money you make? She said, well, I look at the table, and then I see how much um, I've sold, and then I put that money aside, and then the balance is my profit. So I said, how do you know how much money's worth of stuff you've sold? She looked at me like I had a hole in my head and she said, Dana, do you think after 26 years, I do not know how much stock I need to put money aside for? <laughs> now, would I go to the owner of Spa who'd been there for 26 years and say, how do you know what? You know, yeah. you know, she sells, she, she makes 6,000 rand a month. She put two kids through university. Her husband is unemployed. She'd be doing that for 26 years. And there are 10 ladies at the school. So I did a calculation. There's 12,000 township schools in the country with an average of five to 10 ladies per township school selling. Let's say they make 3,000, not 6,000 rand a month. Multiply 12,000 schools by 10 ladies by 3,000 rand a month. There's a massive tuck shop school industry out there. Um, but we don't recognize it, and we don't realize that this is a real job. She's put kids through university. Mav, can you just work that out, or someone work that out? It's 3,000 rand a month times 10 times… Well, 12,000 uh, schools times uh, 10 ladies per school times, times 3,000 3, rand each. How much is that? 3,000 rand keep times up. 10, so 30,000 times 12,000. <laughs> that's insane that's dude. per month 
Oh, per month. That's per month. Multiply oh that God. by 12. Times 12. And, and when we walk past the hawker. What? How much is it? Four billion rand. Yeah. Tax free. And um, so uh, uh, in Gasinomics, my book, before the Gasinomic Revolution, I looked at the Muti sector. The Muti sector is worth four billion rand a year. That's just people selling traditional medicine on the streets outside. Do we consider it a pharmaceutical industry, a sector? Mm. Do you know there is not a single, there are, there's four billion rands worth of herbal medicine sold out there. Bulbs, uh, bark of trees, um, or range leaves, et cetera, et cetera, from moringa to all sorts of different stuff that will cure everything from AIDS to, to, to the common cough. Do you know that we do not have a single company, agribusiness, nursery, or anything supplying that sector with the plants that are commonly known and easy? If you go to any indigenous nursery in Johannesburg, they're growing the same muti plants and delezi and whatever they call it that goes to the muti industry. So 4 billion rand industry, there's not a single business supplying that industry. I think it's the biggest opportunity in this country is just 4 billion rands worth of Bulbs, instead of selling them to Mrs. Smith, who wants to have a little bulb in her indigenous garden, can you imagine the size of the of the Muti industry? Well, then I suppose that begs the obvious question. You know, we're all entrepreneurs. We like solving problems and, you know, spotting opportunities. You clearly say that there's this massive opportunity. We're not thinking about it. We're blind to it. We're like leopards with no spots, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, actually. Um, and so we need to, and through this book and through all of everything that you've discovered, this is a process of finding our kind of spots. Now we do that and we say, right. There's this opportunity to supply bulbs, essentially, to for these sort of informal um, merchants, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, that are supplying at scale for different things. So, well, why the hell is no one doing those? Because, well, two two reasons. The first is that the minute you talk to corporates, they ask what's the business case, and they want the um, the what's why, the return on investment. Why would I talk to business? a corporate, dude? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is informal. No, 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 sure. Okay, so, so, so my first, you know, you got the Moving Tiger on. brands and all of those. <laughs> 100%. So. One of the biggest problems with this and, and something I dealt with in Gasinomic Revolution is that the biggest opportunity in the sector is actually about f funding and financing the, op the people in this thing. One, one of the things that we looked at with the Parmalat project is that we helped support um, outlets that were Gorda outlets. I mean, there were Gorda outlets that... Uh, I mean, I've got a great story about a guy who bought a Jeep cash from the Gordas he sold and stuff like that. We don't realize how big this business. In fact, I was interviewed by um, Azania Masaka in 702, and she said to me, I, I'd been uh, quoted as saying that the uh, township takeaway industry was worth 10 billion rand a, a um, year. And um, she said, geez, can I you know, speak more about this? No, no, no. That's the Gorda industry. The township food industry is worth about 87 billion rand a year. <laughs> There's 300,000 outlets um, employing people and stuff. So anyway, so I had this uh, interview with her and I was on the telephone and I spoke about how big it was. And, and um, she said, um, I've got a little Gorda outlet here from Alex. Now, Alex is the smallest, most poorest township in in uh, South Africa, and I was like, oh, she's got some poor little battered little place, and I'm going to look like an idiot. She said to this guy, tell us about the quarters. He spoke about the quarters, and she said, okay, and um, how much do you turn over a month? He said, no, I make about 50,000 rand a day. And she said to him, 50,000 rand a month? He said, no, 50,000 rand a day. And I mean, you can Google it. There's a, there's a, yeah. a podcast of that. Um, we can't imagine how big these businesses are. The problem is, is that most of these businesses have big cash flow issues. The ability to so there's there's a number of opportunities here. The first one is what I call conglomeration or networking. What Airbnb and Uber and these people did is that they actually got a multitude of small businesses and networked networked them using technology. If you look at the salon industry as an example, there's no salon in the township. People call them saloons, you know, saloons, not salons. But if you go to a saloon in the township, you will never have a person who owns the salon who then employs 10 or 15 or 5 um, stylists. They rent out each individual um, station. So you will have an owner and he'll rent out for 2,000 odd rand per station up to, to these people. And... Um, 
So, so one of my things is imagine the Airbnb opportunities if you're looking for a salon where you can go rent out a, 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 a station. We're not using technology there. Backrooms, backroom, the, the, the rental for backrooms in the township. There's not a township house that doesn't have backrooms, two or three backrooms. Um, so, so every township house has backrooms. They rent them out for 1,200 to 800 rand per backroom. Um, I did a simple calculation. I think it was worth 40 billion rand a year. So 40 billion rand in backroom rentals in the townships. Do you know how you find a backroom? You walk down the road and you say, backroom, backroom, whatever. You walk down the street until you find a backroom. Can you imagine the Airbnb opportunity for that kind of, of thing? So we need to apply technology to these things, number one. Number two, the opportunity is also in financing these. Most of these small businesses have cash flow issues. They buy and they pay. They buy and they, you know, whatever. So um, there's a lady in Soweto I wrote about here who has a restaurant, and she wants to, um, she wanted to buy a coffee machine for 60,000 rand. When I walked into her house, she's got a glass roof. Um, she's got a casual lounge and a formal lounge. And uh, she said to me, we started chatting. And halfway through the chat, she said, oh, I'm sorry. Would you like some tea? I said, I'd love some tea. She said, don't fool tea, I'll let Ellie dear. And her maid came through. And I felt like cousin Dane Fern. <laughs> and she has this great restaurant in Soweto. She wants to buy a 60,000 rand um, coffee machine. She went to APSA. APSA said, first of all, black people don't like coffee. And second of all, they said, you, you, can't, you don't have any audited statements or, or business, um, registered business. We can't lend you the money. Mm. So we are not financing. We are not exploring these opportunities. The opportunities are there. We need to network these mm. businesses. We need to use a, a technology like has been applied, appropriate technology. If we look at impairs and all of these things in Kenya and, and West Africa, they have applied technology far more than we have in South Africa. And... Um, and then we also need to look at financing models because any small business, any entrepreneur will tell you that the biggest issue is about cash flow and and how you, you do that. If we could finance these businesses, we need to change the regulations of how we finance it. And then the last one is we have to change our regulations in our cities. We see a hawker as a nuisance. We try and kick them off. We want cycle lanes, not hawker lanes. You know. So how do we change regulations to allow businesses to be successful on the street corner? I love that. The other thing I'd say, first, if you, I'm going to finish. But can we open the door and turn the aircon on, please? It's resting in here. Um, yeah, the other thing to say is like you have to change your mindset, actually, Hundred percent. It's you know the most important. That's thing. the first thing, yeah. because all that other stuff is the how. The why is actually well. My mindset needs to shift from well building a, you know, a, a storytelling and content agency that's built for the now. What the fuck does that mean? That's completely first yeah. world based. Yeah. Um, nothing wrong with it necessarily. I mean, you know, we do we do well. Um, but if you really want to play, and like going back to what your dad told you. Yeah which is preparing yourself as an entrepreneur for Africa, yeah. you have to think like an African uh, yeah. because it's like, it's like entrepreneurship is the solution to survivalism. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 100%. And, and, and we've got to go beyond that. The other thing we've got to do, I mean, I'm reading a book at the moment called Factfulness by Hans Rosling, who was, you know, he, he, he like does these TED Talks. He's very entertaining. He died recently, though. Um, he wasn't that entertaining. Um, Great guy. But, yeah. and then he's dead now. <laughs> but anyway, Factfulness, he describes the fact that throughout the world today, we are far richer, we're far better off. In fact, the world is in a better place. That's right. One in one, one in a hundred kids died five years ago. One in 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 uh, five thousand or whatever dies today. But one of the things he, he actually quoted it on my Facebook um, author page was actually he said if we eighty percent of our population today is actually in the middle classes, and if you think they're poor. You are losing the biggest opportunity for everything from selling um, personal care items all the way through. I mean, if you look at one of the things I quoted in here, lower income black women spend six to seven times more on, on personal care items and hair care items than rich white um, women. Now, you say, where's the opportunity? Everyone's going to tell you it's among white women in Santon. I have a friend who married, a, he went to Zambia. 
um, with a white blonde wife, and he came back with a Zambian um, <laughs> fairly dark wife. And, and I said to him, one of the things he said to me that he struggled most with was getting to terms with her hair. He drops her in Santon City at nine in the morning. She goes to the salon. And at five o'clock, he phones her. He says, babe, are you ready? She says, what do you think? I'm not ready. Of course, phone me later. And she puts the phone down. She'll sit there for like seven, eight hours and have her hair done. I mean, this is what what Keys at you. <laughs> that was the thing. Now, but we have this... We were trapped by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs says the poor people at the bottom care for uh, food and accommodation and housing. They want shelter and food. And then as they go up, they actualize. Exactly the opposite happens. Poor people, you know, I interviewed some women who um, were social grant women. I said, if you could win something and, and something really cool for you, what would you like to win? And they said the first thing they wanted was money to buy clothes for our children and ourselves. And I thought that was so vain. I was like, these are poor social grant women. And I, and I interrogated it. And they said, because we're poor doesn't mean we want to look poor. The sense, the need to be dignified and respected and admired is more important with people at the lower income levels than, than higher up. That, and, and, and so there were simple things that changed their lives. Now, Hans Rosling writes about this as well. He said, the minute washing machines came out in the world, a woman who spent three or four hours washing clothes could throw the stuff in the washing machine and she could actually learn to read. She could read a book. She could spend more time with the kids. And the washing machine changed the world. So when I said... And and this was before I read the book. I, I, in fact, one of the chapters I talk about is I said to people the same thing. What changes your life? And they said appliances, things like microwaves and fridges, electric kettles. And you suddenly realize why when you start understanding it. So things like a microwave, you had to, if you um, wanted to make baked beans as an example, or beans, you have to soak them for two or three hours, and then you have to cook them for two or three hours using expensive paraffin, electricity. If you've got a microwave, you buy coup baked beans, throw them into a Tupperware, and you put them in there for 30 seconds, using 30 seconds worth of electricity. It actually saves you money. If you have a fridge with a freezer, you can bulk purchase chicken pieces and put them in there. If you have leftover food, if you don't have a fridge, what do you do with leftover of a food you throw it away because it goes sour or rotten whatever now you have a fridge you can actually put leftovers in the fridge and tomorrow morning you give them to your kids to take to school and so on so these things change people's lives and they give them opportunities to to actualize in other ways and and that maslow's thing is is we have these linear things poor people are unhappy poor people are poor they're not unhappy, you know, and yeah. poor people are not unsophisticated. They may not be able to read and write fluently, but that doesn't stop them from being sophisticated. I know many rich people who are miserable. 100%. <laughs> so we make these linear things, you know, I, I, my mother lives, as I said, in, in Msinga still, and we struggle to get her to get into a phone, and WhatsApp is like a foreign thing to her. And I was interviewing a, a Gogo who belongs to a Stockfell. She just turned 99. And I was chatting to this lady about, I don't know, five, six years ago. And I was like, Gogo, what do you use to talk to members of the Stockfell? She said, I'm done. I'm going to use what, what. And I was like, what's what, what? And she, she reached into her breast and she pulled out this little Chinese smartphone and she opened WhatsApp. And she had a group there called Stockfeller. And she said, and I'm this thing, I can use one message and it goes to all the members of the stock fell and I'm on Celsius, so it costs me nothing. Now, she is right at the peak of technology. She's uneducated. She's 95 when I was chatting to her. Mm -hmm. she, she, but she doesn't stop her from being um, technolog technologically open. Yeah. And most importantly, she's sophisticated. And we make these silly things that we think that when we get to poor people, we're going to give them basic product. And then when you get to a high-income person, we give them a sophisticated product. Mm. This is a huge mistake. And this is where um, entrepreneurs and companies lose, you know, um, the noodles example I was talking about just now in Nigeria. Instant noodles is a huge brand. Mm. It was designed for rich kids as a snack. The Indomie company in Nigeria um, has made this a billion dollar a year industry by recognizing what is the problem. The problem, the pain point that people have is fuel. So instant noodles, three minutes. 
but they don't have a 70 gram little noodle packet that your little kiddies have after school. They have a 120 gram one, which is called a hungry man. And then they have a belly full, which is a 300 gram one. So you can fill yourself with this very cheap um, and high protein, funnily enough, um, a filling start. So there they've taken, the, the, the Tolerum group have taken, and Harvard is now writing all about them after I wrote about them, I must say. Um, <laughs> Down with but, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but suddenly, the, 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 the whole um, thing is that they took a sophisticated product and they said, "How does it adapt?" Parmalat cheese slices. We built a one and a half billion rand industry for Parmalat. Something like thirty percent of Parmalat's gross profit now comes from cheese slices that um, didn't exist before. Mm. It's a high end. In fact, black kids who had cheese, who were rich were called cheese boys or cheese girls because cheese didn't exist when we launched cheese slices. Really, premium product. It needs a cold chain. Everyone would say, "Why would you do that? You need something that needs, you know, doesn't need a fridge. It must be UHT. It must be this and that. Why?" Poor people, middle-income people, people in in rural and township environments want treats. They want special things. They want sophisticated things just like anyone else. And they self-actualizing far higher rate. Um, plus, only about 8% of our population lives in a shack. You know, if you ask people, what's your image of the Gasi or a township? It's rows and rows of shacks. Only 8% of our population lives in, that's a 2017 research project that shows 8% of our population. The majority are middle income. Yeah. The, um, so <clears throat> so there was also no data on podcasting. I'm using this because it's an example yeah, yeah. of my, my world. So we did, this was, this was uh, last year, um, towards the end of last year, and it was supported by Jacaranda, loads of radio stations, whatever, we had about 15,000 respondents. Um, it was horrendous trying to go through all the data. Um, but anyway, we basically had all this data. So to verify it, what we did was we got into a plane and we went down to East London, which is the poorest uh, yeah. province in the country. And we hopped onto a bus and we drove to... I forget the name of the towns now. I'm useless like that. Um, but we interviewed, we did focus groups verifying the data and stuff like that. Um, and you know LSM? Yeah. I fucking hate this yeah. whole concept of LSM. They're human beings. They're like, <laughs> LSM is a, is an archaic Neanderthal type this process for marketers to try and understand how they should shape their message. But so is income segmentation. But again, but it's, but this yeah. is your point, right? The whole yeah. thing is actually flipped upside down. So you have to rethink. If you're going to market to these people, uh, you need to change in the entire way that you approach yeah. it. So anyway, if we were, we were in these houses and now we're walking into LSM4 home, okay? These people are supposed to be, to your point, poor, Right? Yeah. No, dude. Marble countertops. They've 100%. got 42 inch plasmas. This, um, they have multiple phones. They drive cars. Some of them have DSTV uh, yep. subscriptions. And we think, oh, no, no, LSM, our, our market's LSM 8 to 10. It's like, no, it's not, dude. Because they, you know, also from a tech, you talk about technology, yep. like they jump. They don't go one, two, three. Completely progging of technology. And, 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 and no limitation to the desire to adapt to it. You and I are still on a linear thing. We went from this phone to that phone to that phone. We're on this linear thing. They're entering right at the top. And there's no like, oh, but why? Why do you think your kid's better at a, at a remote than you? Because they don't have preordained thing that says you've got to do this and that. They just pick it up and they say, oh, well, this is how it works. And they, there's no preconception. There is no, um, you know, heritage behind it. And particularly, I, I, I grew up in Msinga. My mother still lives there. I go to Msinga all the time. And there's not a house there without an electric kettle. Everyone is electrified. Everyone has cell phones. They don't have good data, which is, a, again, it's a stuff up because, you know, Vodacom says, well, black people only want to use voice. And, uh, you know, they want to shout like the ad, hey, Mshobawami across yeah. the valley. It's absolute rubbish. They want yeah. to, WhatsApp is the biggest thing in this country. I mean, the opportunities for app-based mm. A range of everything is just huge in this environment. Mm. I mean, our only limitation is the access to data when you're in rural areas because mm. they have voice only, and um, and something called H something or other. I'm sure you. <laughs> Anything? Any ideas? What is it? 
H plus or whatever H plus. it is. You know the old days when you picked up your phone at H there instead of 4G? <laughs> Just, uh, it's the network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah network, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now, how yeah. strong your signal is in yeah, the area. So, so mm. you, you, and, and, and the middle class in this country, um, the LSM is a good example. There's a there's a, um, a economist called Mike Schussler. He did a thing on LSMs, and he in essence showed that 80 percent of our population, 80 percent plus, I think 86 percent, are between LSMs four and eight. That is the middle classes. What has shaped the world throughout history have been the middle classes. Middle classes invest in education, in a house, in a little garden, in a little car, in the contents to their homes, in their kids' education. They invest in the future. The reason Zimbabwe can have what it has because they've got 2% middle classes growing slowly. In South Africa, 80% of our population is the middle classes. And yet we still have a world of business people dealing with it like they're still w carrying shields and dancing around in car tire sandals. Yeah, last time I checked, I mean, just <laughs> driving here this morning, I mean, it was right there. <laughs> no, but uh, I hear your point. Have you read the book, The Fortune at the, bot at the Bottom of the Pyramid? So... Um, so, so the the funny thing is when I launched my business Minanawe in 1996, um, we struggled to get anyone interested in the black market. We struggled. I had uh, three partners. We, we came out of the politics. We were all members of the ANC and came out the struggle. And my friend Sandile and Sbu and, and uh, Jablani decided that we, there was a space for an agency that focused just on the township and, and mass black market. No one was interested. And then two things happened. And kind of about four, three, four years later, we were really struggling and we were thinking about throwing in the towel. And then the first was that the UCT Unilever Institute wrote a, a report called The Black Diamonds. And overnight, everyone said to phone us and say, hey, we believe you guys can talk to the Black Diamonds. We're like, we've been telling you about this for ages. Like, what's wrong? And then the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid followed literally a year later. And overnight, my business was like suddenly a business yeah. because suddenly – and this is the tragedy is that – we need someone to write a book like that. Or well, I wrote Gasinomics, and everyone is like, we never believe there's a township um, economy. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, um, the reason entrepreneurs are successful, is entrepreneurs don't need a business case. They don't need to have read the book. They need to have seen either a lifestyle-orientated thing or an opportunity or a qualitative basis. And... Um, and, and in Africa, these opportunities are huge. In Nigeria and South Africa, Zambia, the growing economies, Mozambique, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to change the dynamic of, of that. We can't just go and read. Um, you know, once they've written the book, it's too late. You know, it's mm -hmm. like um, – but and, – and part of what I wanted uh, – I wrote about is not to try and do the authoritative, this is what the economy is, but – have you considered the opportunities by just changing the way you look at an economy, the way you look at co uh, opportunities? Um, and, and the biggest one is to say we, Africa is untouched. Africa has a billion people. Um, something like 70% of our population is under the age of 25. Um, we are a middle class. I mean, s some of the stuff I quote in here, I read in factfulness and I was like underquoting the scale of the African economy. Um, a friend of mine, Faye, in Nigeria wrote a book called The Villager and the concept was the concept of um, Africans are modernizing, they're not westernizing. And this creates opportunity because the concept of westernizing means that all they want is that they're coconuts, they're brown on the outside but white on the inside. The reality is that culturally... And culture is different from tradition. You know, traditions that happen in the past. Culture is a living thing. It's around us all the time. If you look at culture and, and lifestyle, Africans, I talk here about the age of the Afropolitan. You know, they talk about millennials and Afrolennials and whatever. I believe today is the age of the Afropolitan, who is culturally very African, but incredibly modern at the same time, but wants stuff that's culturally relevant to them. The opportunities in Africa are for this Afropolitan, this modern person who's not real westernizing. Yeah, they're taking, in fact, anthropologists talk about fast and slow culture. Slow culture is um, you know, social norms and cultural things we do. Fast culture is the adoption of things like cell phones and these kind of things. 
But all people have this fast and slow culture clash between them. On the one hand, they have these things that they adapt to slowly, and the other thing, they're fast. So yes, get involved in cell phones and stuff, but you've got to ask yourself, what's the slow culture component? What are the cultural things that are changing slowly, which we should be adapting to and supplying those things, whether those are... I mean, Mondays in Soweto and Mamalodi and Tembisa and whatever is Mohodu Monday. Tripe is a huge thing. Everyone goes with their Porsches and their Range Rovers and they go to mums and they have uh, Mohodu Monday. You think, you know, like, who's, who's adapting to these kind of things? These are important cultural things to people. How do you become aware of this stuff? Because, I mean, it's, you know, I would imagine that like any economy, it's, it's moving, it's evolving. Um, and so opportunities come and opportunities go. Um, and if you're sitting um, as a young white entrepreneur with only white friends, maybe a couple, you know, black kids yeah. that, you, that you go to school with, you don't really understand because Tabo, your mate from Soweto or from yeah. another township, he's like, you know, there's just an entire other world there. So for young, you know, how does one basically understand, well, where are the opportunities and to keep abreast of it? Because there's no data. Yeah. It's not in the news. This is the first time I'm hearing about it after yeah, yeah. three years of covering, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and business in Africa. Um, and so outside of this book, like where does one start? Well, so, I mean, we're in a country where most of the people are black. So for all the black guys, I generally say, stop looking out the window and look in the mirror. Because it's such an important thing is that the opportunities are actually around us. The opportunity, building industry, you know, black people have a whole different idea of what's cool in a home. Uh, ceilings are the coolest thing, you know. Stop nonsense, you know. Stop nonsense is. Uh -uh. It's a fence. It's a like a, a, a like a fancy garden wall or a fence. It's called stop nonsense, you know. So when they get directions, they say, "Oh, you drive down the road, you'll see the house with stop nonsense." You turn left there, but. There's a whole style of building. You know, what are the opportunities for architects, for building people, anyone involved in decor? Um, I did a huge project for Mr. Price home, uh, Mr. Price, a uh, Pep home. And Pep's um, buyers go to China and they buy all the stuff and they come back, they put it in Pep stores. And then all the people we spoke to, they say, why would you go to Pep? They say, those curtains are the shittest curtains you've ever seen. We go and we buy the most expensive curtains at Wayland's or whatever it might be. It's like people like, no, no, no. And when we showed the pictures, we took pictures of 2,500 houses around the country and we showed them to these pet buyers. They were like, Yira, do black people like that kind of stuff? You know, they were like, they couldn't <laughs> believe it. Um, and, and, and so it was like simple stuff, just understand what was important. So, so the first thing I think from a black people's perspective is, 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 and youth particularly, is this thing of stop looking out. You're not going to be the Elon Musk, but you could be the Dangote. You know, Dangote is the richest man in Africa, I think the 10th richest man on the planet, by understanding the Nigerian and West African economy. There's economies around here that, that, that are, are, are huge and opportunities around them. I think going on a broader basis is that um is, is is for me the biggest thing about this is curiosity is that if you're curious about this you know i mean half the time i chat yes i speak zulu and a little bit of sutu and some Khosa, but most of my thing is when i go into these environments i'm curious about it and i'm really you know fascinated by lifestyle and and what's changing in lifestyle because the pace of change is dramatic um and, um, you know, I look at my, you know, my kids go to private school, granted, but I mean, my daughter, Zandi, gets the highest marks in the class with 20% black kids who, you know, four or five of them are Zulu. And they're like, Zandi, why is Zulu so important to you? And Zandi's like, because Zulu is the most important. They want to learn English, you know. It's a tragedy because Zandi is now, and Zandi in her class, her teacher, her Zulu teacher loves her. She says, you know, Zandi makes the black kids want to learn Zulu better than than they could. And this is this curiosity thing, is that we've got to change our mindsets about this. But we've also got to change our mindsets about who is that population out there? I mean, Factfulness is a great book and, and uh, do some uh, research around people like Schussler in South Africa. But we, we need to 
break this thing about saying township people or the economy in South Africa is in a mess and uh, there's lots and lots of poor people. That's a political statement. It's not a business statement. All these poor people, uneducated black people living in the townships, oh, we've got to redistribute. We've got to have an inclusive economy. We need to do land, um, you know, hand back the land. That is pol politics. Get that shit out of your mind because actually the reality in the township environment – the vast proportion of our population is incredibly economically active, incredibly modern, yet culturally African. And those opportunities, if you're a white person in, in Santon and you think, oh, shame, these poor people all live in shacks, you have no chance to make a business. If you look carefully at that business, and I use some great other examples, yeah, Hello Pacer is another one. I think just the building industry, you know, is just, there's so many industries. Um, and, and, um, I mean, apart from the fact, buy my book and 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 uh, make me rich. <laughs> buy this book immediately. <laughs> you, you, you never make money from books. I mean, <laughs> that's one thing. Stay away from books. Don't don't write a book because you won't make money. Tell but, you about uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the opportunities about changing our mindsets, not only in entrepreneurship in South Africa, everywhere else in the world. But if if you know any one of the 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 things that really excite me about business, where people look at a society in a different way. We take out the politics, we take out the, oh, feel sorry for the people, and we actually look at people and we understand what makes them happy, what turns them, you know, what are the things that people do every single day that, that are, are exciting and, that, and, and, and then how do we adapt something to that? And the biggest opportunity for me is how do we adapt technology and financial systems to adapt to this market? I mean, one of the things, you know, everyone says black people want to use cash. I'm like, okay, go to a township and try and use your card. The only reason people use cash is because they have no alternative. Create the alternative. You know, there's a story of two um, shoe salesmen who go to, who sent from Italy to sell shoes in, in Africa. And the first one arrives and he says there is no market for shoes in Africa. They're all barefoot. And the second guy arrives back to Italy. He says, that market is huge. They're all barefoot. <laughs> and that's the thing. is like, what is the opportunities? Mm. We have to change that mindset about what those are. And the opportunities are huge. Mm. Um, have you heard of something called Benny Spice? I know Benny very well. I worked on Benny, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so ben, but just about the opportunity thing. So Benny Spice is like a thing that you add to like soups or stews or yeah. poiki or whatever, but mainly to bland foods like pap. So if you think about the staple, which is mainly yeah. like pap and occasionally pasta for a change or whatever. So Benny comes along and it's like, well, it's how much is one rand? It's the cheapest thing. And it's like aromat, so it's like yeah. super tasty, right? And so you can put it on eggs, you can yeah. put it on like when you were at the, you know, the taxi ranks, what have you. And this thing is just huge. It well, is in, in like fact, Tiger brands can't make enough. But I'll tell you an interesting thing about the talk about lifestyle. So when when Benny was launched, it was launched primarily among the vegetable hawkers. Now the vegetable hawkers sell ingredients for what's called a sashebo. And I'll tell you about a shebo just now. But the vegetable um, hawkers were all from Mozambique. And Benny is huge in Mozambique. So when they brought it to the vegetable hawkers in South Africa, they were all like, Benny, of course we know Benny. Yeah, yeah, yeah bring us Benny and we can sell it. Um, but now, uh, just to rewind a bit. So um, I created a, a TV reality show for Unilever about eight years ago. And it was called The Perfect Shebo Show. And... Uh, so, so the funny Lots thing of is gasps that gasps in the yeah. studio. <laughs> so, 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 but there was you. So, so the sashebo, a sashebo is what a curry is to Indians, a sashebo is to Africans, and a sashebo is, is a, is like a stew, a casserole, whatever it could have vegetable, whatever, and it, in, it incorporates a soup for thickening. It includes like raja curry powder. It incorporates a narok stock cube, and for Unilever, we created this um, thing about. And this was a concept around this thing about modernizing African women because a modern African woman wants to create her cultural dish, which is a sashebo. But she's got modern issues like convenience and time and stuff. So we create this thing. We said using these ingredients, raja, norox, um, nor, um, you can create a perfect sashebo in X amount of minutes. And we had this TV reality show. It became the biggest cooking show in Africa. In fact, 
you know, I, if I go into the t- if I tell my friends in the northern suburbs that I created the perfect Sashebo show, they kind of look at me like, like, what's that? If I go to the townships and I say to women, I created the perfect Sashebo show, I'm like Jamie Oliver, but really? like I'm much bigger. <laughs> you know? It's like, and the perfect Sashebo, eight years later, is still the biggest cooking show in Africa. It's the tenth most watched program on South African television, and it's a commercial ad between Shoprite and Unilever, sure. and built around this concept of a, of, a, of an African dish in a modern context. So it's a modern cooking show built. This is what I'm talking about: using culture and lifestyle and combining them. Do you know Duncan Irvine? No. From Rapid Blue, produces most. I suppose he does many shiny, shiny dance floor stuff. I always thought maybe maybe you guys knew each other. He's done most of the big stuff, but that's that's fascinating. Fascinating, rather though, that's really incredible. Um, yeah. So I want to talk to you about education, but before we do that, can we do the Injustice League? So the guys will set up. You're not you're unprepared. You just have to answer this question and then follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, what is one injustice that I mean, you can, whatever this might be for you, but what is one injustice that you see? Um, let's talk about in this context uh, that you feel really needs to change. I would say that, well, the, 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 the single biggest one is probably that, um, you know, how, how our government and our municipalities kick businesses off the street and treat them like they completely, um, you know, they chase them off the streets. They're not businesses. There's no recognition of that. And that's a starting point of, of the, um, of, of the problems out there. Don't worry, it won't that move. That scares me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I won't find this on the streets of Germany. No, you won't. No, no, no. This is very formal. Uh, but uh, carry on. You're saying. Yeah, no. So, so I think that that if 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 you know, like talking about those the the, the, the people um, that what I call golden delicious, those people selling fed cooks making thirty thousand rand a month. Um, when I say to them, "What is your biggest problem?" They say, "We have no guarantee." And if you so they don't invest money into their business, so they've got an old um, um, door as their table, and an old piece of plastic on them. I said, well, why don't you get a proper table because you're running this good business? I said no, because the city council will come and confiscate our stuff, and then we have to get another one. So now we just have a door. Now, if if we recognise those businesses and we didn't chase them off the streets and we sort of them the same as we'd look at a king pie or any one of those kind of things. Those people would invest in their business, would grow their business. What do they do? They employ more people. They 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 paying VAT for all their purchases. They're actually growing our economy. And most important part about it is that, you know, we're talking about 30% unemployment in this country. Well, actually, that's 30% formal unemployment. That's I a believe, big deal here. Hey? I believe that, that in, unemployment in this country is probably closer to 10% if you take the informal sector into account. That puts us in the same place as the U.S. The U.S. is, I think, 8% unemployment at this stage. So no one measures that informal economy and says these are people employed. Because when I say to that lady and her husband who's selling the uh, Fed cooks, I say to them, um, do you have a job? They say no. So if the census people come to them and say, do you have a job? They say no, because a job so has true. a pay slip. And so we have this distorted um, you know, calculation of our, of our country's employment, um, and we need to bring those informal businesses into a sub-level of our formal economy. Not exactly the same. They're never going to become corporate and all of that. But we need a society, uh, uh, we need a level within our um, economy and within our regulations, within our financial institutions, which recognizes either informal economy or micro-businesses or entrepreneurs. Anyone who starts a business will tell you, you treat it like shit. No one recognizes you as a business because you're a small little business. And actually, we have to change it. That's an injustice that, that small businesses need to be recognized amazing and with that in mind here's your baseball bat uh you can put your mic down on the uh, no no you got to stand up and do this properly (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so so just as you think about that injustice you can just um smash our little mascot here for christmas off you go (laughs) oh (laughs) is that is that all you got (laughs) is that all you got that's (laughs) Yes, round of applause. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Good work, son. Good work. So, I mean, the thing that fascinates me about this space is 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 the is the capabilities. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, on this show, I can't tell you, man. Like, the the number of times it's come up uh, about education, you know, and we've, we've you know we've we've really got to do more about education and stuff like this, and and then yes, but that that's true in certain contexts. But then you look at what you're talking about, right, in this book and stuff like that, and you say, well. How do how do you how do you I mean how much education do you need to make thirty thousand rand a month selling fed uh, uh, so where yeah. so is it bullshit and and because I mean like I've said before on the show like the half the reason or the main reason I should say why I do this show is to is to inform and educate and inspire through stories like the ones you've been sharing but educate is a, is a word in that that why yeah. and then you say well but who am I educating because there's a line where that stops yeah. There's a most definitely big ass line in the sand where that stops yeah. and it starts to become it's like the law of diminishing returns on an exponential down curve. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean it's a, it's a very, very it's a great question and, and I think so. So there's no question that we need to have basic education where people can get to call it even standard eight or whatever you call grade uh, 10 now, um, where you can read and write and do basic numeracy. Um, but the education that most people are talking about is actually education for a formal economy, number one. And number two is, a, is education for an economy that's old, gone. It's the old one. It's the one where you wake up at eight and you go off to work wherever you might be and, and whatever it might be. The reality is that the biggest problem about the informal economy is that Every single time I meet someone who's in either government, in the jobs fund, or this or that, or whatever, they say to me, the problem is we like what you say, and yes, there's a huge informal economy there, but actually those people are only there because they have no alternative, which is such rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. I chatted to the one lady who was selling stuff, and I said to her, if you, and she could make five, 6,000 rand a month, I said, if you could get another job, would you get another job she said yes and Gosana, and come and wash your underpants in your house and she had the perfectly she could be a domestic worker instead of working for three hours a day and making six thousand rand a month she could take a taxi to my house she could work for eight hours as a domestic worker earn two and a half three thousand rand a month take another two hours and three taxis home and get home at seven o'clock at night the misconception is the informal economy is not about making real money and it's actually not about real businesses. And this is the tragedy. And so the education component, which is a very valid one, is that people look at those people and say, the only way they would get out of being a hawker is by us giving them more education or skilling them, upskilling them and stuff. But what are the skills they're going to teach them? They're going to teach them cash flow management. The lady who laughs at me and says, you think after 26 years, I don't know what the, do you think she doesn't know about cash flow? She knows all about this shit. So the reality is that we actually, what are we trying to teach them? What do, what do most, what do many of the people in education or, or um, any of this thing know about those informal businesses and actually know what stimulates those informal businesses? And I mean, well, how many of the ones in the world that are successful today, from Amazon to, to, to Airbnb, were based on education? So let's talk barriers then. I wonder if George Bezos has an MBA. Does he? Does he? Mav, Google, can someone Google George Bezos education to find out if he has an MBA? Um, so well, yes, I think well, basic well, education yeah. is critical. The yeah. schooling system has to get past where we have this shit level of education. But it is not going to help anyone get um, a, a better job. The education system will not do that. Mm. Not the education system at my kids' private schools, unless they want to go and work at uh, mm. Investec. Just that, yeah, so a couple of things from my side, my side. What are the barriers then? Because uh, Or constraints in the sense of like, you know, an entrepreneur who – um, isn't trying to service this market, but I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who's on you know, like LSM one or two or whatever the case is. Like where you grew up, doesn't have running water, for instance, no electricity, etc., um, or whatever that context might be. Like, what, what's stopping them? Do you know what I mean? Because if you think about the scale of this thing, the, there are like millions of informal entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. So, and tribal uh, culture and communities and stuff like that. It takes a village to raise a child, etc. 
there's invariably someone that they know in their network that is already doing this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So what what are the actual barriers? I mean, outside of education, what else is there? So, so look, one of the first one is cash flow. Um, you know, you've got to start somewhere and keep your fa- feeding your family while you're doing this. I think one of the biggest barriers is, um, well, f- for me, one of the 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 the, the the big problems about getting new people into that market is that um, is a, is the perception of any form of um, respect, of dignity, of aspirational value. So, if you ask someone, "Who do you want to be like?" What do they want in this country? What do, if you ask a school leaver, "What do they want to be?" They want to be a civil servant. They want to work and work for the government. They want to be a nurse. They want to be a doctor, or they want to be Patrice Mutsepe. Very few of them actually are looking at a real job around them. And the worst is is that very few of them are going to start a business like Nando's. Whereas there's a million township businesses that are starting a little Nando's. I mean, I wrote about a guy in here who's got a chicken uh, business in Soweto. And he's got the city of Joburg has given him a piece of land. And he's in a container now. I mean, it's a tiny little container. But he's going to build a drive through chicken place. And he can see it in his mind, and he's just raising the money and getting loans from buddies to build that that um, thing. We're not creating this society where we're dreaming about turning our little chicken place in a container into a drive-through, because actually the guys who've been that successful, whether it was uh, Raymond Ackerman at Pick and Pay, started one shop and ended up with three hundred, or um, you know the Nando's guys who ended up with the Nando's thing, they all started with this business and this huge idea of where they could go to, but they could also mobilize income whether it was from the Jewish community or whether from a formal banking system and all of these things. And we've actually got to say it's not about whether these informal businesses or businesses. It's about how do we make their dreams come true? How do we actually say this person who's got to selling 3,000 Fed Cook every day, how do we make them the next King Pie or make them the next, um, you know, what's the one with the um, the the donuts? Um, you know, like Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' or? Donuts. Well, how can um, why not? I mean, the Fed cook for South Africa is the donut for whatever. Why can't that husband and wife raise some money? And I mean, whether they want to or not is one thing. But they could be their son could say, "Well, shit, I'm going to take this business. I'm going to turn it into the Dunkin' um, Fed cooks of of the township." The first change is that change of mindset about what is the opportunities. And the second one is how do we build all the infrastructural things around them? Banking, financial, municipality. I mean, there goes um, Mashaba. He's so excited because he found someone with a trolley with full of cow's heads and got them arrested. I mean, please, you know, is that is that the 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 the, the, the he's, he's proud of that? Mm. Actually, why didn't he find fifty hawkers and elevate the fifty hawkers off the street and into a little mm. uh, business? You know, we've got to change those mindsets because um, and 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 on two levels, I think on the one there's entrepreneurial opportunities to get all of these businesses and say, how do I gather up twenty or thirty and create the Dunkin' Donuts? Or um, also from the bottom up, where we say to these businesses, you want to have a drive through. Well, how can we fund you? How can we finance you? In um, I was spoke, uh, someone contacted me the other day, wants to launch a financial business in South Africa, which is based on a Kenyan model. And the Kenyan model, they only lend out, I think the maximum is $20 at, um, at a time. And they only lend it out for a month at a time. You cannot lend for more than a month. So it's $20 for a month, and then at the end of the month, you can. And the only form of surety is you have to bring a friend with you. And they have 99% repayment. You bring a friend with you. They work on the whole African thing of community and, 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 and social pressure. And, um, and, and they do something like, I think they were like $600 million US dollars business in West Africa, lending out 25 um, dollars maximum at a time. 
Now, that's the other thing we have to change is that our business is about hyperfragmentation. Uber is about hyperfragmentation. Airbnb is hyperfragmentation. Amazon, what's the biggest order that Amazon sends out? I can't believe it's more than, say, $50. But they send out millions and millions of those things. We've got to change about personalization and, and, and these multiple small transactions because the world's become more personal. The world's become more small scale on a large scale. And, and that doesn't apply only to the informal market, but it certainly applies incredibly much to that informal market. And that's why technology, I keep mentioning it as an opportunity, because technology can take these million little things and network them, either using a payment system or an ordering system or just a search system or whatever it might be that, that, that's required because technology allows us to take these multitude of little businesses and say, how can we grow them? Mind equals blown, <laughs> legitimately. This has been such a fascinating talk. Um, sure. Just... Uh, yeah, guys, this is called Casinomic Revolution. Uh, Casinomic. fuck sex. <laughs> um, do you see what I'm saying? So this is my problem. I'm going to have to learn how to speak properly. <laughs> but yeah, two things from my side. Um, one, how does one engage in something like this? Because it just feels to me like I can't even say fucking Casinomic properly. You know what I'm saying? Now you're saying, well, even if I understood the hyperfragmentation and the gig economy and I see an opportunity, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Getting it in market, the go to markets is about engaging with people on the ground. Yeah. Like I don't speak Zulu. Like there's fundamental communication barriers. I'm not using that as an excuse. Mm. I'm saying how does one solve that problem from an engagement and go to market perspective? I have a product, Benny. Yeah. For argument's sake, Benny's competitor. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Um, and I want to now look at distribution in the informal space, which, hey, man, you know, these, these dudes aren't on Facebook. They probably are, but they're not, <laughs> you're not going to get your scale there. This is about face-to-face -face distribution in established, you know, distribution outlets. There could be hundreds of thousands of them just in a country like Nigeria. For example, how the hell do I do that? How, where do I start? How do I get over myself? and my own prejudices and my own fears about, you know, being judged or whatever yeah. the case is, um, in order to unlock that opportunity, what words of wisdom do you have there? Look, at, at, you know, the, the starting point is to say, although it's called gasinomic revolution, this isn't happening in the township. So if you go here two kilometers up the road to Randburg Taxi Rank, just do yourself a favor, tomorrow morning walk around Randburg Taxi Rank and see the Gassi course businesses and look at the hair industry and look at whatever it might be. I've been if to you, Eastern if, Cape, if, if, okay? If, did you not listen yeah, to that part? Yeah. The if, you, <laughs> if you walk down the road here, just there's a bus stop opposite Hyde Park and there's a little container there and that person sells about 200 dishes a day of what's called Amablady, which is have a range of different food for 35 rand each. So it's good money, like you know, seven grand a day kind of story. So, the, the, uh, And it's right here. So we don't have to go to a township to do that. Yes, I said, you know, the black kid who's there, wow, look around you and see what the opportunity is. But the informal economy is actually all around us. It's right here around us. It's literally on every street corner. It's every taxi rent in the inner city. And, and that's number one. Number two, you know, the funny thing is I hardly ever speak Zulu to people when I meet them in the townships or in the taxi ranks and stuff because I meet a Bedi and then they come to me Tobela and I can't speak Bedi, so then I just stick to English. And there's a whole thing here about lingua franca, which is the reality is that most people speak really good English and communicating with people in South Africa is easy peasy. Because everyone speaks English. In fact, in, in the big, my biggest problem is when I go to the north, they all speak Afrikaans and I can't speak Afrikaans. So then they all laugh at me because the black people speak Afrikaans and I speak English back to them. So, um, But, you know, we mustn't let those things like language or, or place um, limit us because it's around us, number one. And number two, it's so easy to really engage in that when you open your eyes to this and you actually see it around you. And go to the hawk and just say, how many fed cooks do you sell a day? You know, she'll happily tell you, you know, and buy a few and enjoy the angels singing. But it's around us, you know, it's, it's right there. And, and I think that we often think it's in that shack settlement with the gangsters and all mm. of that. It's around us. The informal economy is right here. The difference in South Africa is the informal economy, we don't see it. 
Whereas if you go to Nigeria, Nigeria's the informal economy is 97% of the economy. So you don't see the rest. So, of course, you get South Africans shoot off to Lagos. And Lagos, amazing place. 20 million people in the space the size of Joburg. It's an incredible city. When you go, or you have all these expatriates, they go to Nigeria and they say, wow, the Nigeria, you can't believe how big the informal market is in Nigeria because there is no other one. And then they walk around the marketplaces. Mm. They come back to South Africa and they walk, won't walk into Randburg Taxi Rank. Mm. It is really around us. And, and when I was talking on one of the radio stations, I spoke about street food. People said, you know, in Taiwan, people phoned in. Ah, in Taiwan, I, in Thailand, I, I went to, um, I loved the street food. And then someone else said, no, no, when I was in Bali, I loved the street food. And then someone was in South America, you won't believe in Mexico, the street food. I was like, and in South Africa? You know, it's amazing street food. Did you buy it here? I don't know. Why don't we? Because actually it's right there. There it is opposite Hyde Park. Four ways, um, right there on the corner between Four Ways Crossing and Four Ways Mall. There's a lady who's making the most delicious food. I promise you it's half the price of what you'll buy it and certainly much better for you than McDonald's. And yet when we go to Bali, it's a couple of thousand Ks away, we'll go mm. to the street food vendor on the street corner and buy whatever she sells, some beetle or the other. We won't buy a delicious blade steak from the lady at the Shisanyama on the street corner opposite Four Ways Crossing. We've got to change our mindsets and we've got to open our eyes to this around us. Do you guys have any questions? For him, Q. Q wants to you. <laughs> Now, uh, back to what you were saying, there's this guy in Soweto, he runs um, a car wash. He only does cars for BM and Mercs. It gets so packed. Like, it's, it's insane. And one car costs 100 rand. And then, down the street, there's a normal car wash, which costs 50 bucks. But then people go to that one because now he has this, he's labeled it as for BMs and Mercs. So it got that class and stuff. So that was very smart of him. So, yeah. you know, adding to that whole Cassie thing is very, it's, it's insane. And Cassie, I think that people dumb it down. They don't believe that there's an opportunity just for Mercedes and BMWs at Cassie. Mm. You know, they think, no, 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 that'll only in and whatever. Why? We, 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 we dumbing things down where we mm. shouldn't. And, and, and that guy knows it. He's mm. like, this is what, you know, you, are, you walk into many of the sh uh, taverns in Soweto and you can't buy a court. No in Gutu, there's no in Gutu in here. You can't and you can't walk in here in tackies mm. and jeans and whatever. And yet in people's mind you talk about let's go to a township tavern. I take people to township taverns and then they sit there drinking single malt whiskey saying, But surely we can go somewhere that's genuinely so where to, you know? Because they want to sit on a crate and drink from a court. Because yeah. that's the perception we have. But it's not like that. It's single malts and ten year old wines, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, mate, last question for you. Um, why do you do what you do? So, well, um, why I did what I did was because I sold my business and I had a whip behind me. My passion now is very much around, I believe that the change in this country, we never, you know, um, Ramaphosa and before him, Zuma spoke about creating a million jobs in this country and we were talking about it. I really passionately believe that the real opportunity to transform our economy is by recognizing the informal economy and on two levels getting businesses to invest in the informal economy and on the other hand getting the small businesses in the township to respect how important their roles are because only by transforming the informal economy and not formalizing it but transforming it and recognizing it and helping it grow can we create a million or more jobs, many more than a million jobs? We can create those in the sector. So I now am a freelancer, and, and one of the things I'm trying to do is to to preach the word of this revolution. And, and um, I think that the more businesses in South Africa, small businesses that can get involved in that sector, partnering with informal businesses, we're creating, growing these businesses. I use some good examples um, in the book about that is that um, that's the only way we're going to change our economy. And, and when I'm in the township, in the Gassi, in fact, not in the township, downtown, Joburg, Randburg, Taxi, I love it. There's an energy, there's a passion, there's a vibe there that we miss out on in, in many ways in this country. And, and that's the vibe that's going to change South Africa. And 
um, you know, the Minister of Small Business said a while ago, we need to create more entrepreneurs in the township. And I was like, oh my God, there are thousands of entrepreneurs in the townships. You wanting to create an Elon Musk or a Bill Gates, but the entrepreneurs that are there are in businesses that you can't even imagine. And those are the ones you should be saying as Minister of Small Businesses. There are millions of businesses in the townships. How can we make them work better, employ more people, make more profit, network them? And, 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 and sadly, we're still in a society where we are still stuck on the Transformation of our economy is going to come from discovery, Investec, uh, you know, FNB, Anglo American. Which is the biggest uh, irony, right? And it's not going to happen there. Yeah. They've flatlined. In fact, if anything, they're declining. Look at all of those. That economy is declining worldwide. How do we change that economy? In, in, in Africa, it's the informal sector. In the rest of the world, it's the gig economy or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but um, you know, there's very similar, uh, there's huge similarities between gig economies and and internet economies and and the informal sector, and that's the future. That is the future. And and um, and and if we don't look at it, we're just delaying the future. But it carries on with its own way, you know, and and ignores what's happening around us. Every time I go and talk to these small businesses, they be amused. I say, I wrote us, give them a copy of my book. I wrote about you. They're like, why about me? I said, because your business is amazing. Now imagine if every one of them said, fuck, your business is amazing. You know, let's, you know, that would change our economy. Well, on that bombshell, Gigi Alcock, everybody. <laughs> Uh, mate, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute awesome uh, privilege and honor to obviously have you in the studio. Um, I really hope that this episode helps you, you know, spread this message. I think it's such an important one, especially now. So wishing you all the best. Fantastic. Thank Cheers, you mate. very much.